Hello everyone, welcome back to Dragon Age Awakening. Uh, this is the end, I'm pretty sure. Unfortunately, I had to cut the last part short because of life things, but we are back and ready to fight this absolute abomination of a monster. The Mother. If it isn't the hero of the hour, <laughs> the slayer of the mighty father, come to claim a reward. <laughs> oh, what a delicious day. That's a lot of nipples. They just get bigger and uglier, don't they? By the ancestors. Do all brood mothers smell this bad? Yep. Am I not beautiful? <laughs> Grey Warden come now to slay the mother too? Will she join the father in oblivion? Answers? My, but you are brave. Once, beautiful music sang to us from the deep, called us near. We would search for that voice. But the father, he was flawed. He heard only a twisted shadow of it. He hated what it did to us. He said he wanted to free us. But all he brought us was silence. Ah, dreadful silence. But now the father is gone. The mother can take her children deep into the earth and care for them. Safe and sound. Yeah, you're gonna die. Then the silence ends here. Perhaps we will hear the song again when we die. Oh, let it come. Let it come.
What? That looks absolutely ridiculous. I'm just gonna leave my sword there. Mm, is it? <laughs> that one group just stuck.
After the deaths of both the architect and the mother, nearly all the remaining darkspawn fled back into the deep roads. The raids on Amaranthine came to an abrupt end. Although some of the architect's disciples likely escaped into the deep roads with the rest of their brethren, they have, so far, shown no inclination towards vengeance against the Grey Wardens who killed their saviour. Yet the deep roads remain plagued by Darkspawn, and it seems certain that in time, another blight will begin. The danger may have passed for now, but the cycle of the old gods continues. World, w word of the Grey Warden's heroic salvation of Amaranthine spread like wildfire. When the magnitude of the losses of Vigil's Keep came to light, sympathy drove generous donations from all over Ferelden into the region's coffers. Amaranthine was restored to her former glory within a year, Vigil's Keep in five. Because of the Warden's support for law and order in Amaranthine, Constable Aiden and his men were able to distribute the smuggler's goods to the battered survivors in the gruelling days that followed the Darkspawn defeat. The Darkspawn messenger, set free after joining the Wardens in the Battle of Amaranthine, struck out on his own. The city soon buzzed with stories of a cloaked but lisping figure who aided travellers in danger. At the same time, reports of isolated cases of the Darkspawn disease emerged. No one connected the two. The war devastated the farmholds of the Arling, but the land survived. In time, opportunity would attract settlers from other regions. As always. Dirk, one of the pranksters behind the Blight Orphans scam, was fortunate enough to survive the Battle of Amaranthine. The unconditional generosity of the Blight Orphans' mysterious benefactor inspired him to establish a legitimate charity dedicated, dedicated to children orphaned in the attack. His sweetheart, Melissa, eventually bore him two rascals. Vigil's keep stood alone against a horde of Darkspawn. The Mother's forces outnumbered the Vigil Vigil's defenders many times over. But the sturdy dwarven walls proved impervious to any boulder an ogre could throw. The Vigil's soldiers, clad in silverite, each felled a dozen Darkspawn before they died. The Vigil held one night, then two, then a week, and eventually the attacking horde broke upon her walls. The keep developed an, developed an almost mythic reputation, the few survivors immortalized in song and legend. Peace allowed the Wardens to replenish their numbers. Soon, Vigil's Keep wore a capable army with Wardens at its core. From their ranks emerged new heroes to challenge threats to Amaranthine and all of Ferelden. Through taxes and levies, the Vigil was rebuilt. Years later, Voldric Glavonach stood on the battlements and pronounced that the defences were acceptable. He would never speak more highly of any human engineering. <laughs> Dark whispers of conspiracy against the Wardens fell silent after a rash of accidents and disappearances culminated in the apparent suicide of Ban Esmerel. The nobles of Amaranthine remained dutiful. Some even suggest they were cowed into submission. Among the many legends that the Vigil spawned was one of the great heroes of the next age, a sheep herder turned soldier by the name of Sir Alec the Valiant, who eventually found an order of knights that lasted a thousand years. Dwarkin Glavanach further refined his Lyrium Sand Explosive, but left the Warden's employ after Canari mercenaries tried to assassinate him. Although the Dwarven Bombardier took his secrets with him, they learned to say he left clues for others to follow in his footsteps. The Vigil soldiers, wearing the distinctive silverite armour that Master Wade crafted, came to be known as the Silver Order. Under the tutelage of the Wardens, the Silver Order developed into one of Ferelden's most revered military forces, a lasting memory of the Vigil's famous commander. With Valena and the Architect gone from the region, the Pilgrim's Path began to see traffic again. The massacre of the militiamen and the merchants, however, led to hostilities between the neighbouring human settlements and any Dalish clans that passed by. One human villager soon kidnapped and murdered a Dalish child. The clans reacted by giving the Wending Wood a wide berth, but both sides knew that at some point the elves will return from revenge. A few years after Calhirol was emptied of Darkspawn, Orzammar began sending expeditions to rediscover the knowledge of smithing that had been lost within the Taig. Eventually, House Helmy decided that Calhirol was too important to be abandoned. At a tremendous cost of dwarven lives, they cleared the tunnels leading to Calhirol of all Darkspawn, making the road between Orzammar and the fortress safe again. Calhirol was reclaimed for Orzammar, once and for all. As promised, Voldric and Dwarkin presented Orzammar's shape route with the stone marker that told of how Calhirol's castlers had taken up arms against the Darkspawn. The Commander of the Grey was invited to Orzammar as a guest of honour at a feast commemorating the defenders of Calhirol. The shaper read the names of the castlers off the marker, 
then presided over a ceremony to return them to the stone, as befitted warriors of their stature. In time, the Arling began to forget the tales of apparitions in the Black Marsh, and that ever so slowly, settlers drifted into the region. Scholars said the veil was still thin and thus the area is still dangerous, but the people only cared that there were no longer frightened whispers in the shadows. The village was slowly rebuilt. Twice the Baroness's min mansion was rebuilt and occupied, once by a wealthy merchant and another time by an Orlesian mage. Both died mysteriously. Afterwards, the mansion was torn down completely and the site left untouched. Anders remained with the Grey Wardens a few years longer, training the Order's next generation of mages, but when the Circle Tower called on him to deliver a lecture on the nature of the architect, much to the Templar's dismay, Anders told the Commander of the Grey that his time with the Wardens was over. And yet, not two months later, Anders returned to the Order. Ever after, the Wardens were his home and last his lasting companions. When the walls of Vigil's keep were breached, the surviving defenders watched in horror as a section of stone collapsed upon Velana. When the rubble was later cleared, however, there was no body. Velana was just gone. Nathaniel managed to survive the battle at Vigil's keep, leading a spirited defence in the last minutes to protect his family home. That ferocity impressed many of his fellow soldiers, who hoisted him to their shoulders and paraded him around the courtyard when the battle was done. After spending a number of years with the Wardens, Nathaniel realised the life was not for him. He said goodbye to his sister, Delilah, and his new nephew, then left to seek his fortune. In time, that nephew became a Grey Warden himself, in emulation of Nathaniel, then rose to Warden Commander. He brought honour to the name How to the Howe name once again. Justice fought valiantly at the Battle for Vigil's Keep, but before the victory horn sounded, a Darkspawn sword removed Kristoff's head. It was, of course, unclear whether the spirit of justice perished or simply departed. At the least, Christoph's wife, Aura, was finally able to claim her husband's ashes. With the mother dead, Sigrun seemed to lose her purpose. She withdrew from her friends in the Order and spoke to them less and less each day. One morning, Sigrun was simply absent, her bed made and her trunk emptied. A young recruit who had been up in the night said she had left for her calling, gone to finish what she started in Calhirol. Ogren continued to, continued to regale young warden recruits with tales of his prowess in both battle and bed. His drinking games prompted at least one recruit to declare that she'd rather reattempt the joining than lift another mug. <laughs> Felsi returned to Vigil keep, Vigil's Keep several times to see Ogryn, but usually bringing the toddler as well. Ogryn's inability to act seriously wore on her, however, and her visits dwindled, then stopped altogether. If Ogryn missed her or his child, he never showed it. As for the saviour of Ferelden, she did not remain as commander of the Grave for long. The Darkspawn were no longer a real concern, the blight well and truly over. It was time for her to move on. She returned to life at court, resuming her duties as Queen of Ferelden and receiving a hero's welcome when she rode back into the capital. King Alistair awaited her at the palace gates, grinning from his head. <laughs> Some years later, the saviour of Ferelden vanished entirely. Nobody knows for what purpose she departed, Yet neither does anyone think her tale is complete. This is the most incredible game, just in every way. I'm so glad that I gave Dragon Age a chance, honestly. <laughs> I was going to make a video essay about this, but I've decided um, because I need to save storage space on my um, computer. <laughs> I cannot keep most of my footage, which is kind of sad, so I'll just do a brief explanation here. Um, so basically, I did say at, at, at some point that um, The Lord of the Rings was the thing that got me into fantasy, and I absolutely loved that book. I, I read it several times, and it remains my favourite book of all time.
and um, yeah, it kind of stayed that way. And fantasy was my absolute favorite genre. And then a couple years ago, I read the series Throne of Glass, which managed to be so awful that it completely put me off fantasy. Um, and yeah, it kind of killed my interest in it. And when I started playing Mass Effect, I kind of inevitably heard of Dragon Age as well. But because I was so, like, just avoiding fantasy entirely by that point, I was just like, oh, fantasy, oh, no. And especially their rep for Bioware's rep for romances was just, was just a big no-no for me. I was just like, nope, not gonna play fantasy game. Gonna stick with sci-fi. Uh, but, yeah, more, more, but then more recently, I was like, you know what? I'm just gonna I'm gonna play the first Dragon Age and, and see if it's good and see if I like it. And holy shit, that is legitimately one of the best decisions I've ever made. Honestly, this game has just been incredible from start to finish, in every way. And in all honesty, I think Alistair may have even edged out Ahsoka Tano as my favorite fictional character of all time in anything ever and that's I do not say that lightly I don't know there was just something so like maybe it was the voiceless protagonist that's just made me so much more invested just being able to build that relationship with characters myself rather than through the eyes of some of a of a, another character I, I, that was something that I honestly didn't expect to appeal to me so much as it did. Um, but yeah, I'm really glad that that happened. <laughs> this music, man. I will say, um, The Lord of the Rings may be my favourite book, but hot take, I do not like the movies. One bit. <laughs> and I think the music uh, the score for the movies is... A big reason for that. I just cannot stand the amount of like 90s, cheesy 90s singing violins. Just, ugh, no. It doesn't fit at all in, in Lord of the Rings. Just, just that's my opinion. Um, every Lord of the Rings movie fan in the world is probably going to come and attack me now, but that's what I think. <laughs> As I was saying, um, like the soundtrack of this game is like the Lord of the Rings soundtrack, but with all the cheese taken out of it, and I love it. Like I'm an absolute music nerd. Like, like I want to go into video game music eventually. Um, <laughs> So yeah, um, looking forward from here in terms of um, this playthrough, I'm going to do the other three DLCs, uh, so that's Leliana's Song, The Golems of whatever it is, and Witch Hunt. I'll be playing those. Um, and after that I will be moving on to Dragon Age 2, which I'm super excited for.
podcast. Oh, this is just for this DLC. I find it odd that there weren't credits at the end of um, the main campaign. Let's see if there's any more names I recognise. Yeah, Robin Sachs, of course. Bilana was great at Lyle? Of course it was her. She voices Nasana, how could I forget? Oh, I'm such an idiot. Quite a few familiar names in here. Jesse Gervais, he's David Archer in Mass Effect 2. Um, Mark Mir? Who was he? Alex Walton Regan, of course, voices everybody. John Smith. Steve Valentine, that's Alistair. Um, Simon Templeman. Who was he in this DLC? I know he was Loghain, but Loghain's a bit dead. Unless if you spare Loghain, maybe he appears. I don't know. Because I don't remember hearing his voice in this DLC. Just vibe to this musical day. But yeah, this game has no business being as good as it is. Like, Bioware completely outdid themselves. Which just makes me sad because you know, recent years, they've struggled to make anything even, like, averagely good. Because, like, Andromeda is a total dud. I do not ever want to go near that game. <laughs> um, and things aren't looking very good for the next Dragon Age game. And the next Mass Effect is so early in development that we haven't heard anything about it really, apart from the fact that it's going to be on um, Unreal 5, hopefully, which does give me some hope. But yeah, just like even the, the Game Awards, it's just normally when they announce things they haven't said anything, so yeah, it's kind of sad because this was, this is Bioware at their very, very best and it shows what they have been capable of in the past. But most of those people don't work for them anymore, and honestly that's kind of sad because they're a different company now and obviously not up to the same standards that they once held themselves to, and yeah. I hope at some point, I hope someday they can get some of that back, but Honestly, with EA on their backs all the time, I'm not optimistic that that'll happen. But I am remain- I'm retaining some optimism. I just- I want things to go well for them so badly because I know what they're capable of baking. So yeah. Quite a ride, huh? 
congratulations if you're still here, I guess. Um, I'll see you guys in whichever DLC I decide to do next, I guess. <laughs> Haven't decided which one that'll be, but yeah. This has been Dragon Age Awakening. And I'll see you guys next time.